this is about um, the 10 steps I took to making tech contributions. And the first place I started was internal knowledge sharing. Uh, this is an example we're seeing here where I'm doing a, a workshop for my colleagues, um, training them in Angular unit testing. And there's actually a lot of ways you can do internal knowledge sharing. And when I say internal, I mean internal to a company. Uh, for example, here, there's um, you can document your shared libraries and tooling. You can document the onboarding process, how to set up your development environment and which tools you're going to need and so on. That's actually very helpful um, when you're first joining a company to have all of this in place. Like there's there's not, not much worse than joining a company and you have to spend days to set up the whole thing and, and no one remembers how to do it. Uh, you can also document your system and project architecture. That can also be helpful depending on your churn or how, how many people are leaving and joining the company and whether you're using consultants or contractors and so on. Uh, you can also just share some recipes or maybe instructions for uh, some code generation tools you're using. Um, uh, you could also share a blog post with just inspiration and look at this new thing, or you can mention it in the chat, uh, your company chat or whatever. Um, we can also do more like uh, in-person events, uh, not right now, but I guess you could do it virtually and, and sometimes you do, but uh, it's, uh, it's usually very good to do this in person. Uh, like you can have uh, hackathons to basically you get to pick what you want to work on for, for a day or two or whatever. And uh, that, that can spark some innovation. Um, the, the main thing there is, but you need to follow up on it afterwards. Like the, the organizers or the company hosting that hackathon should do some action points on, on actually taking some of these ideas and, and seeing if they can progress into something, uh, a new innovation for the company or for a community. Of course, you can also do internal tech talks and workshops, and I, I've been doing that for, for many years. You can mentor uh, junior developers or a full stack developer that needs to learn Angular or <laughs> React or whatever. Uh, you can do pair programming, which is uh, usually very helpful. And you can, of course, do code reviews. That's also a way of, of transferring knowledge and, and sharing your, your professional values and conventions and, and so on. But con that's not really contributing to the tech community at large. That's just internal knowledge sharing. So, but that's where I started. And then I started uh, my tech community contributions by doing a talk at a meetup, just like this one. Uh, uh, this was, I think it was in 2018 um, in Denmark. There's a, a local meetup in, in Aarhus, the second largest city in, in Denmark. And I had been attending for a few times and um, the organizer was asking me about what I was doing at work. And I was telling him about, about uh, some, some new projects we were doing and he thought it was very interesting. So um, he asked me if I would like to, to do a talk about something like that. And uh, <laughs> I, I ended up uh, creating this uh, model view presenter with Angular talk. Uh, that we're seeing here in, in the picture. And it was a great moment for me because that, like that, he motivated me to do that talk. And that's what push, pushed me beyond just internal knowledge sharing and into external contributions to the whole tech community or parts of it, right? Um, and so, so the best advice there is just go do it. Like, don't wait around. Uh, I mean, I had been thinking about writing articles and uh, for years, I hadn't been thinking much about doing tech talks uh, at meetups, but this is the moment that kind of pushed me um, off the edge uh, and just take a dive into contributions and, and turned out I, I liked it very much. And uh, the organizer of that meetup is, is a close friend of my mine uh, today. So it's also nice, like that's that's another, part of, of meetups is you get to grow your network and meet people that are really passionate and, and into the same things as you and, and 
have having uh, heated discussions and so on. <laughs> so that's um, that was a very nice experience for me. Uh, I have a few tips about speaking at meetups. Uh, first of all, practice, practice, practice. Uh, remove all the unnecessary content, and then remove some more. <laughs> Speak out the words loud uh, when you're rehearsing. It's it's one thing to have it in your head or even written as a full script, but just saying it out loud, even to yourself, or even better to to a friend or, or wh whomever might understand what you're talking about. That's the best practice. Uh, it gives you a lot of, of confidence, and you won't um, stumble as much with the words when you're going to speak them at at the meetup. Um, so that that's a very very good tip. Uh, you should also try to engage with with your audience. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult than virtual. Uh, meetups uh, because of the delay and, and people enjoying themselves. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing at home, but <laughs> you're not very active in the chat right now. Um, and also, don't feel bad uh, about your performance. It's it's it usually feels a lot worse than it actually is. Um, I went home and watched the recording of that talk, and I felt that that it was terrible, but turned out it wasn't so bad, and, and people actually gave me good feedback and and yeah it's it's usually feels a lot worse than it actually is so again just go do it and and uh, find out how to to make yourself more calm and, and confident about your topic then i actually started uh, writing tech articles it was uh, originally based on this this first presentation i did at a meetup about the, the MVP or model view presenter pattern for combining that with the Angular framework. That's actually an, an ongoing series that I, I'm still uh, adding a chapter to every now and then. So that's been an interesting journey as well. Uh, lately, I've been writing about testing as well as we can see in this, this image. Um, so that, because that's one of the things I'm into is, is automated testing and um, automated workflows and CI, uh, software architecture. <laughs> and uh, Kass is telling me he's here. That's nice. Nice to, to write something in the comments. Thank you. Um, yeah, so writing articles, uh, again, I, I had been thinking about it for years. I've been doing it a lot in, internally on the company blogs. Um, it's, to me, it's, it, was just, it was just about doing it again. Um, because like, what's the worst thing that can happen? You'll be very happy once you have done it. Uh, so don't get yourself too worked up about it. Just go and do it and, and you will feel great. Move on to the next thing and don't have regrets about how it could have been even better and so on. I mean, of course, if you see something terribly wrong, go, go fix it. If you, but other than that, just leave it and move on to the next thing. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I was actually contributing quite a lot. Uh, I started on a publication back then. It was called Angular in Depth. So it was about Angular, and it was in-depth articles. <laughs> uh, that later became a company that's now called um, In-Depth Dev, uh, based in Ukraine. Uh, now it's expanding into other topics than Angular. And I wrote there for a while as well, uh, but uh, let me get back to that later. I have a few tips for writing as well. Um, first of all, write in a natural language voice. Don't don't, don't try to make it an academic paper. Uh, people's attention spans are very short, and and they they don't write. Then they don't like. Um, getting tired of reading your, your content just to, to learn about a topic. They will leave and find things that are easier to read. Focus on just one core topic per article, and then remove everything else. Avoid abbreviations uh, when you're writing for a worldwide language. Uh, don't use uh, EG or IE. Um, write out the words instead. Like uh, instead of EG, you can say, for example, instead of uh, IE, can say that is people will understand that but they even if they know the abbreviations it'll be harder for them to read your content when they have to 
do that mapping from English to the local lang language and, and so on. Uh, so, so avoid that. Find your niche. Uh, to me, it was Angular for a few years. Uh, uh, now I'm getting more into the NX toolchain by Nawal, uh, monorepo tooling uh, for uh, not only Angular, but React and uh, Node.js and Nest.js and Next.js and Storybook. And yeah, it's, it's a very, um, how can I say it? Like it's a very versatile tool chain and uh, has a lot of nice APIs you can use for for creating plugins yourself and, and adding better support for your framework and your use cases and so on. Um, get a mentor. Uh, to me, it was um, Max Koretsky from the Angle in Depth and now In Depth Dev. Uh, he helped me with my first articles and that was a, a, a great inspiration to me. So like find someone who can help you and support you and review your work that uh, will do wonders for your writing. Uh, my final tip here is uh, don't stop or rather stop listing code as images in articles. It's fine for Twitter, but don't do it in articles. Like people can't use it for anything. So it might look nice, but it's a terrible experience for the reader. So think about your reader. No, don't think about your fancy bling. Uh, code snippets. Um, the three main ingredients I, I always keep in mind when I'm doing my writing is uh, these three parts. I, I like to explain the theory and the concepts on an abstract level, but then I also um, try to write something for different types of learners. Like some people just learn in code samples. Uh, so they did just want to see the code and they don't want to read about the concepts in depth. Uh, so just show them some code. It has to be simple, but realistic code examples. So don't do foo and bar, uh, use real or realistic uh, use cases instead or <laughs> animals, <laughs> whatever. But, but more, um, ideally it should be something related to business. So it's a realistic scenario, but it should be simple as well, so so don't get too advanced because you'll lose track of the core topic of the article. And the third and, and all, also an important one, visualize the concepts. Uh, some people are more of visual learners and even the ones that are not, uh, it'll usually help them remember your content. When they refer to it later, they can uh, review the images, then can review the code samples and, and um, get up to speed again quickly. And um, we have an example here, one of my uh, visualizations of route guards in Angular. So those are the ones that are saying, you're not logged in, go to the login page, or you are logged in, or you are an admin, so you're allowed to go to the admin page. Uh, so just things like that makes it easier and more enjoyable for the reader. And that's what it's all about. And then I started contributing to open source. Um, as we can see here in my timeline from on GitHub from 2018, uh, I made a few contributions to Angular. I did a lot of experience, uh, experiments as well. I created some work in progress libraries and some uh, ready for production libraries. And that's usually a, a nice exercise, but you really need to find something that you think is interesting or you'll lose interest. But open source, it doesn't have to be contributing to existing projects. It can be example projects. And I've done quite a lot of them myself to um, demonstrate uh, some concepts or to experiment and trying to push a framework beyond its, its um, limits and so on. So I think I have almost 80 repos in my GitHub account. And <laughs> that's the, the, that's the, the type of things I've been doing. I've also been making minor contributions to, to different uh, projects from Microsoft and uh, the Angular and, and NX and, and so on. Um, and as we see in the, the heat map of, of my GitHub profile, um, it's been growing my interest in open source. And uh, for this past year, it's it grew beyond a thousand contributions on, on GitHub. Um, so it's it's nice to see that 
I'm not losing interest. On, on the contrary, uh, I started um, maintaining some open source projects that we'll discuss a bit later. Um, if you want to get into contributing to projects, documentation is always a great place to start. It's always lacking and is easier to contribute to than the code base in a lot of cases. Um, try to focus your efforts on, on one or a few projects that you uh, feel is interesting and valuable. And if the development environment is too complicated, don't waste your time. Just use the CI workflow. That's what I do with Angular because it's very complicated to get their development environment up and running, uh, especially if you're on Windows. The same goes for NX. Um, so don't waste your time. Uh, find another project or work with the CI server, but that gets pretty boring pretty quickly. Um, then I was actually lucky, lucky enough to, to start, um, get some light here, to start speaking at conferences. Uh, this is from NG Poland in 2019. Uh, great conference. Uh, it was also JS Poland the, the very next day. And the nice thing about conferences is you get to meet a lot of, or even more um, nice people uh, than at your local meetup. And that's actually where I met a lot of these people that are here today, like uh, Valentin and Nikita, uh, Serkan as well, um, and many other nice people. Uh, for example, I think I have another one here. This is Alex Okrusko. I've met him at a few conferences, and he's a very nice person. Uh, he recently switched from working at Firebase to now he's at Cisco. And I've really enjoyed um, getting to learn, uh, to know, getting to know Alex. Um, uh, he's, a, he's a big open source contributor uh, himself and also does writing and, and speaking at conferences and so on. Um, I even got to bring my family. So sometimes this is uh, my wife and my twin daughters. And next to them is sitting uh, Michael uh, from Norway that I also met to a couple of conferences and, and speak uh, to on a regular basis. So conferences and meetups, it's all about um, meeting people making friendships and, and growing your network. Um, of course, it, it can be quite a challenge to, like it takes a lot of preparation, first of all, and you need to get accepted to even <laughs> get there. Uh, but if you manage to do it, you'll, you'll be very happy that you did. Um, when Once you start uh, speaking at conferences, you, sh you should really time your rehearsals because there's usually a very short time span between your talk and the next speaker. So that can be a bit of a challenge. So for example, if there's a 25 or 30 minute time slot, don't speak for 25 or 30 minutes because they need time to switch speakers and get people out of the room and next people into the room and so on. Uh, so be very careful with, with your timing. Uh, I. I usually, <laughs> um, I try to like take a pessimistic look at what could go wrong. So I export my slideshow as a PDF and bring it on a USB stick just in case my laptop doesn't work or gets stolen or whatever. I can borrow a, a computer from someone else and that has actually saved me a, a few times. <laughs> um, Go visit the speaker's room and other uh, speaker's events like the speaker dinner. If there's something like that, that's a very, very good time. Um, do I have anything else to say about conferences? Uh, well, uh, 2019 was, was the year I started speaking at conferences. I went to the NG Vikings conference, the Angular conference, and it was in Denmark in Copenhagen. Um, I went to the Angland Dev Conference in Kiev, Ukraine, and I went to uh, Warsaw in, in Poland for the NG Poland and JS Poland conferences. That was that was great. Um, I was hoping to do a lot of conferences in 2020, but COVID put an end to that, and I, I really lost my interest in, in conferences after that. Uh, but who knows? Maybe next year. 
So I actually went on and started uh, mentoring uh, writers and editing and, or reviewing their articles. Um, there were a lot of new writers joining the, the in-depth uh, website or, or community of, of writers. Um, so again, I, I got to know a lot of people um, and I got and I really enjoyed um, helping people improve their writing skills and and uh, like giving them my, my my tips for writing and we'll I have a few more I think um, in a few slides. Uh, yeah, here, here's some of them. Uh, don't include any fluff. <laughs> Add value, not volume to your content. Get straight to the point. People have a short attention span and there's a ton of articles out there uh, for the same topics usually. So don't write a long introduction. Just explain what you're they're going to learn and get right on to into the content. Um, if you write longer articles, and I, I sometimes do, <laughs> uh, make sure they're easy to scan, uh, but also consider splitting them into individual articles to make them easier to finish reading and and reference them later on, because it, it can be a hard time to scroll through a, a very long article. Um, include your own perspective and add your own experience to, to bring that unique value to your articles. I mean, there can be 10 articles about Angular React components, but your experience is, is the unique part. Um, so make sure you add that. Finish strong. Uh, so make sure you, you write up um, a nice summary in your conclusion. Um, recap what, what the reader has just learned. Um, maybe add your suggestions on what would be the next step from here maybe references to other material and um, yeah just finish on on a good note don't skip the conclusion uh, because that's yeah just finish strong it's very important uh, the introduction and the conclusion should be as good as the main content uh, i was also lucky enough to to receive the microsoft mvp awards in in developer technologies and when was that? 2020, I think. Um, uh, so let me share a bit about that process in case you you want to do something like that yourself. Um, first, <laughs> the first thing you need to do is uh, make community contributions like the ones we're discussing today. Uh, contributions is not only open source. It can be open source, but it can also be articles and talks and meetups and books and um managing communities and forums and, and a lot of different things. Uh, so once you have done that, and that's not the easy part, of course, uh, you need to get nominated by a Microsoft employee or a, a Microsoft MVP. And yeah, I just figured at some point it could be interesting to see if I could become a uh, Microsoft MVP. So I asked a friend of mine, and uh, then I went to the first step, which was uh, then I, I was asked to submit my contributions in a, a web form. And then the program com committee, um, they compared my contributions to the contributions of other people in my region of the world and in my category, the developer technologies. And I guess they figured I made some good contributions. So I. I received this MVP award and a certificate or whatever um, signed by Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. And then every year you have to go do it all again. I mean, you don't have to get nominated again if you're already an MVP, but on the 1st of July, uh, all your contributions are reset as far as Microsoft is, confer um, is concerned. So you have to... <laughs> continue making contributions to the community uh, to stay an MVP. So you can you can go back to step one, but you can skip step two, but that's it. It repeats itself in a loop. Um, I also started authoring a book. Um, and this one is about Angular. I won't bore you with the details on that. Um, 
but I will, sorry, I will share a few tips uh, from my point of view. Uh, first of all, it takes a lot of time. Uh, you can join with a publisher to so that they can take care of reviews, the design, the distribution, the marketing, and, and even more. Uh, but in return, you have to <laughs> provide them with a very detailed outline and an estimated schedule so that they can make their bosses happy. Um, don't write a book to get rich. You probably won't become rich by writing a book. And again, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> That's my experience. Um, recently, I went into more permanently maintaining open source software projects. Um, we are building a small team of, of different um, people, um, maintaining a few repos on GitHub. Uh, they are listed here. I don't know if you can read it, but it says uh, NX worker and NG worker. NG is for Angular. NX is the NX tool chain. Um, so we're we're doing a lot of different projects there. Uh, we're doing an Angular testing library right now. We're doing NX plugins for NX workspaces and Angular. We're doing uh, Lumberjack um, is a logging library for Angular. We just we just finished uh, the release candidate for version two, uh, so that's exciting as well. Um, and a few connected projects to that. So. The team is uh, Nacho Vasquez, who's in the chat. It's Serkan also joined, and Santosh Yadav also joined the team. So um, this is, uh, yeah, this is the nice part about open source. Find a team that you like, and you'll have a great time. And also find a project you like or, or start your own. Uh, write some documentation. It's boring, but it's very important to get people to be interested in your projects. Uh, I mean, you can have the best code in the world, but if no one understands how to use it or why it's there, what's the point? Encourage and support contributions and feedback from the community. So that's very important. Don't um, build a gap between you and your community. Don't leave PRs and issues hanging. Uh, because there is a difference between open source software and openness in software. And there's a good publication here by the Linux Foundation about determining the true openness of open source projects. Uh, openness is not about having access to the source code. I mean, that's maybe the literal uh, description of open source software, but there's even more ways to be open, like open governance and open projects and processes um, and open communication. So yeah, this is a very, very Nice resource. Uh, I strongly recommend you read this one. Um, so just go to the Linux Foundation and search for openness, and you'll find it uh, or use this link. Um, my final step in tech contribution so far is I I left the in-depth dev uh, group, and I created two publications of my own on the dev community, dev.to. And this one is called This is Learning. And it's about free, open, and honest software education. Uh, it's um, free from conflict of interest. So there's no affiliation with any company. Uh, it's all about sharing knowledge. And it's not about numbers or making money. Uh, and I invite every one of you to join if you'd like to start writing or, or already uh, you already are writing. Uh, there's a second one specifically focused on Angular. It's called This is Angular. But you can find them both on the dev community. So that's what I had for you today. So thank you very much for, for listening. And then Valentin is, is back. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lars. I don't know, I cannot say for everybody, but I was really listening like this. <laughs> so it's it's really inspiring. And uh, while I was listening, I formulated three goals for myself for this year regarding the writing some articles, some open source projects and stuff. So it's, uh, I, I just wanted to say thank you once again. But I have some questions. And first of all, so when I was um, uh, writing some articles or, uh, trying to do something apart from my uh, regular basis job, it always was kind of related. 
because you're doing something in your company, you come up with some new library or some stuff, and you can share this knowledge if it's uh, okay, if it's okay with the company. So, uh, what's your opinion on that? So, it, 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 is it possible that you work on a company on some technical stuff, but you write and uh, you do open source on absolutely something absolutely different? So, for sure. Um... It hasn't been the case for many years that, that many companies allowed you to spend time on open source. But in the past few years, we've seen a kind of new movement in this area that uh, more companies have developer relations or developer advocates. And uh, more companies are offering that you can spend your, your working hours or some of them uh, doing open source because we're also depending on open source projects. So maybe it could benefit the company if you're writing a, a pull request for uh, the project you're using, um, or maybe you can release your own software that others can use and, and your company can benefit from that as well. Um, I am now luck lucky enough that I have an employer that, that allows me to spend 10% of my time doing uh, whatever, basically. <laughs> uh, it's uh, or spending on knowledge sharing. So sometimes I, I spend some of my working hours writing articles. Sometimes I prepare a talk like this one. And other times I contribute to open source. And that's a really nice balance. Uh, keeps me sharpening my skills. It keeps me aware of what's going on. And and I can share <laughs> the system aid name with, with the community as well. And, and you can learn that it's a, it's a good place to work. And they have nice people working there. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Uh, that's something I was always thinking about. And the next question is uh, the one I was also wanted to ask. So how to combine the life and the open source and all such contributions, especially if you have some kids, you have two twins, I have two daughters, the guys can also have three children. So what's uh, your vision on that? Apart from 10% of time on the work. I don't sleep very much. <laughs> probably five and a half hours per day on average. So when, when do you prefer to uh, do your technical stuff? So later in yeah. the evening or you try to get up earlier, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm usually doing uh, te tech contributions at night. Uh, so the daytime I spend with, with my kids and my wife. And when they go to bed, I go back to the computer and <laughs> write some code or, or some articles. Uh, so yeah, the short answer is I don't uh, sleep much, but the, the longer answer is um, yeah, it's just, it, it's a, an interest. Like it's my personal hobby. It's how I relax. It's relaxing to me, even though it's similar to work, right? But I get to choose what I spend my time on and, and how much. Uh, uh, so sometimes it can even help um, like get rid of frustrations with the project you're currently working in, like uh, like someone else is deciding something that you disagree on or you're not working with the technologies you love or whatever. But you can do that in, in open source. Maybe you're frustrated that you have to deliver features as, as if you're a feature factory instead of focusing on code quality. So in open source, there's time for greatness. There's time for high quality software. It's actually expected, right? So there's no room for uh, shipping fast uh, because of time constraints or whatever. Uh, no, no, you should focus on quality. And that's that can be a really enjoyable experience compared to some working situations. I see. I see. That's, that's, that's pretty nice. Um, another thing, uh, looking to the tips and listening to that, one of them was really uh, touch some strings in my soul. Uh, it's about the academic voice of language. Um, and personally, I have uh, previously experienced being a tutor in a university and uh, publishing some articles with uh, uh, my science tutor and stuff. And it uh, changed me a lot, uh, making uh, all that academic uh, soundness uh, for the articles and stuff. So how you come up with that? Uh, it's just and based on so it's just based on um, experience. Um, I started out doing academic 
uh, style writing. Uh, uh, but yeah, I guess it was Max who told me first. Max Kuretsky who to told me first. Um, don't like, don't be so technical or like uh, try to speak in a more natural voice or something like that. And it just stuck with me. And um, yeah, I guess I'm just I'm reading other people's stuff and uh, what I dislike about other people's contest contents, I'll try to change that in my own. And it's kind of evolved over time. And online content is more about short and easy to read and enjoyable to read. So it's, it's different from a book. Like a book can be academic and very abstract. And as I pointed out in, in like, you should also have, or at least I try to also have like abstract and theoretical level, but then you make it more relatable by turning it into code and drawings and illustrations as well. Uh, so yeah, it's just my my personal experience and, and advice I, was given to me and and I've been thinking a lot about it ever since. Um, I also have an academic background, so <laughs> I didn't know how else to to begin, right? And and you want to make sure everything's perfect and you want to cover every single detail, but you're actually not doing yourself any favors by, by doing that. You should uh, be more relatable to your audience and you should speak directly to the audience as if you're sitting next to each other. So use terms like you and, and we instead of they and one should and they do and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's about being relatable um, and engaging with your reader, even though you wrote it once and they, they read it at a later t point in time, but should be able to relate to each other in, in the best way possible. Okay, uh, is it okay from your perspective to put uh, uh, words like, do like this, don't do like that in the articles, ah. like imperatives? Yeah, you should be careful with the words you're using. Um, I try to remember not to use words like easy or just or simply uh, and things like that, because again, it, it, it builds a gap between you and your reader. Uh, maybe it's easy for you or for me, right? Because I, I spent uh, months researching this, but it's it might not be easy to the reader and, and the reader will feel might feel very stupid if you're saying it's simple and they don't understand it uh, right away. So avoid using words like easy and simply and basic and of course and, and, and stuff, like, uh, words like that. Uh, and what were the other ones you were asking about? Anything in imperative way, like you should do like that, or you should mm -hmm. not in any case do like this. Like this is a uh, crap. Well, there. I mean, you can choose to intentionally make an opinionated article, and I've done a few of those. <laughs> but you shouldn't alienate people either by saying you're doing it wrong. Uh, I've done that as well. <laughs> don't do it intentionally. Don't do it by, don't try to demeanor your audience or, or uh, telling them that they're poor developers indirectly or directly. That's not the point, right? Okay. So be um, nice to your reader. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I, I think I can keep endlessly <laughs> with such kind of questions. It's also, it's always a really interesting topic for me. So the very first article I wrote, I was hesitated, I, I, I don't know, several days just before I published it and uh, it was polishing, polishing, polishing. And there is a nice comment from Kos also. So do not hesitate to post the first article. It will never be 100% <laughs> polished. Yeah, uh, but maybe a couple of more questions. Uh, what's your favorite duration for the article? So the, the time the reader should read it. It should usually be around five to eight minutes of reading time whatever mm -hmm. that means. Uh, that's usually the sweet spot for online articles. I tend to write uh, longer than that. Um, but that's first of all, because I, I usually cover some pretty advanced or novel topics. But secondly, because I also try to include those three main ingredients. So uh, it, it fills out more text and and content when when you're also trying to to live up to these three ideals of, of good content. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm trying to make shorter articles. It's also 
usually more enjoyable because you can finish faster and move on to the next thing. <laughs> like uh, a comment in the chat, don't don't spend uh, too much time perfecting it and making sure everything's hundred percent correct. I mean, you you'll get feedback, and and like I said, you'll be very happy when you move on to the next thing. You won't worry about the previous one. You'll just enjoy the good feedback from from people and, and having finished something and. And in a lot of cases, you'll you'll be referring to it uh, later on yourself um, when you forget forgot how to do it, and <laughs> you'll be happy you wrote about it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good advice actually. And um, what about the book? Is it is your book published already? It's not published yet. Uh, I'm working with another Danish co-author. Um, I don't even know what it's going to be called. I don't care too much. The, the publisher will decide that. But it's about um, Angular Ivy, so that's version nine of Angular, and and today we're at version eleven. It's about the stable features of Ivy. It's a, a functional guide to the the interesting, most interesting features of, in my opinion, of of the newest versions of Angular. Uh, so first, there's a bit of uh, theory and and simple examples about how you can use these new features of Angular and TypeScript. And then there's like a real world application where you write new features for, for this existing app using some of the, the new Angular and TypeScript technology. And then the final third part is um, about migration, um, migrating from the old view engine uh, to the, the Ivy renderer in Angular and, and about how, to, how Ivy improves your, the developer experience in, in various ways. Uh, so yeah, um, it's not done yet. It'll be a few more months, uh, and then it'll be available on, uh, I think, on Amazon on and on Pact Publishing. Um, so it'll be affordable for sure. Um, I like to share content for free. Uh, so I joined with this publisher so I could not publish it for free, but at, at least it'll be affordable, uh, hopefully, to to very many people, and that's. Like I'm not trying to make money, just trying to <laughs> share it with a lot of people at an affordable price, and, and the publisher will earn most of the money. <laughs> but it's it's just for sharing knowledge and and trying to have another experience and see how how I like that. Okay, so once again, thanks so much, Lars. It was just incredibly cool and nice talking to you and listening to all that inspirable stuff. So I enjoyed it a lot. So. Thanks, and I guess we are closing up. So if you want to say anything, so feel free, and uh, I will end the broadcast. Uh, I don't have anything more to say, except thanks for, for having me, and uh, thanks for, for being here, all of you in the audience. Uh, I'm. You can uh, send me private messages on, on Twitter. Uh, just search for my name. It's very long, so there shouldn't be anyone else with that name. <laughs> and thank you for yeah. having me, Valentin, and and thank you, Nikita, for uh, you're the first one speaking up against module federation, except for me. <laughs> Every time I do it, uh, Zach, the creator of module federation, gets mad at me. So <laughs> nice to have another person <laughs> supporting me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you, Lars. Thanks to everybody who stays with us till this very same moment. And uh, have a good rest of your evening. Take care, guys. See you. Bye.